Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of How to Save the Planet. I'm Mona, your favorite climate campaigner. Today, we're joined by the wonderful bird enthusiast, Kabir Kool, who talks us through how we can bring nature to us while we're in lockdown. And back again, we have Isabel to co-host. Isabel, say hi. Hiya. Yeah, I'm really happy to be back and looking forward to this chat. Yeah, you've been researching, haven't you, how to make your garden and your kind of balcony the most bird friendly? Yeah, well, I'm I'm in a gardenless flat, but I'm I'm make, trying to make the most of the, what's around me and seeing seeing the nature from my windows. Perfect. Well, I hope you enjoy. I chat with Kabir as much as Isabel and I did. Kabir, we're so excited to have you. Um, I know Isabel and I are very key. So, just for the people who aren't aware about the great work you do, who is Kabir? So I'm Kabir. I'm 14 years old. And I'm a passionate young conservationist and wildlife writer. And my main focus is wildlife and biodiversity in London and other urban areas too, but particularly in the capital. And I'm an RSPB youth counsellor too, to represent the views of the RSPB's youth membership. And what, what does RSPB do? The RSPB is the largest charity, conservation charity in Europe. And the youth membership in particular has over 195,000 members. So we try and represent a fair view of the current affairs in the conservation world from their perspective. Sounds so cool. I mean, I when I was 14, I don't think I've ever had just, I, I mean, what, what was I doing? Isabel, can you remember what you were doing when you were 14? <laughs> well, I, I grew up in London also, um, but I don't think... I had sort of noticed the birds that much. The pigeons, I noticed those are pigeons. So, and uh, birds particularly, that's what got you interested in it all? Well, I've always been interested in wildlife, but birds in particular, because when I was about seven and looked out uh, into my garden, I saw it was predominantly pigeons and sparrows and blackbirds and green finches. It was predominantly birds I would see. And that is really what got me interested in British wildlife in particular. It was mainly birds. So I got binoculars and a field guide and I went off exploring in my local area and then London as a whole. So it has mainly been birds. That sounds really cool. I just, I mean, I know you're a youth counsellor and I, I, for me, when I hear counsellor, I just think of the typical, you know, like local counsellor, decision maker, robot. Um, but um, how, how did you apply for the role? Uh, how, and, and like, Do you have kind of hopes for it? As in kind of, because you're, you're representing such a massive number of young people. Are you like, this is what I'm passionate about and this is what I want to do? To be a youth counsellor, you have to be elected. And these elections are held every single year through a magazine called Wingbeat, which is the magazine of the teenage membership of the RSPB. And I first came to know about Wingbeat when I was asked to write an article about London's wildlife about three or four years ago. And I've been writing regularly for Wingbeat ever since. And I came across this election and I thought this would be great. I'd, I'd love to apply because... With the youth, with the the opportunities of being a youth counsellor is, firstly, to meet other like-minded young people, experience a, a lot of aspects of the co- of conservation, and also to learn from the other youth counsellors because they all have something to offer. But most importantly, it's to raise awareness to young people, because if children do not notice the wildlife around them, they won't have the knowledge to protect it, and that's why it's so important that young people deliver this message to their peers. I totally agree because I just, I too am a Londoner um, and I just think particularly when you're in urban areas, you don't really, like, you don't notice it and almost wildlife is more like the disdain. You're like, oh, rodents or just, you just, it's Definitely, not yes. as appreciate. I'm like squirrel. Get yeah, it doesn't sound the prettiest of that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think it's so nice that almost like you're putting on a new lens of like, actually there's so much cool um, wildlife, just biodiversity in London that we don't really appreciate. And I think now in the lockdown, because we're all sort of staying in our local area a lot more, everyone is looking a lot more closely at stuff. And I have never sort of seen the birds or noticed everything around me so much. Yes, it's, yeah. it's so important now during the lockdown to make the most of the wild, watching the wildlife on our very doorstep, whether it be from our garden or our balcony or even out of our window. There's quite 
a lot of opportunity for us to make a difference if we can as well. So, so what, what have you been doing during lockdown? I've just been watching wildlife from my bathroom window. It's, quite, it's been quite successful, actually. I've been brushing up on my bird calls, and that's allowed me to hear a lot of the bird song in my local area. And I've, I ignored it completely for quite some time. But now we're in lockdown. I've decided to come back to learning bird calls. Wow. And just through learning the bird calls of common species that you find in, in spring at this time of year, uh, I've identified a willow warbler on my doorstep. A willow warbler uh, is a migratory warbler, uh, well, a migratory bird that um, you can hear singing at this time of year in gardens, in woodlands as well, especially in meadows. And it was great to hear one for the first time on my doorstep. That's so cool. So that means they migrate and come back in the spring. Yeah, they migrate right? every year and they come here for the spring and the summer and they leave at around the autumn, I think. I'm just thinking, can I practice my bird calls? Yeah. <laughs> can you give us an example? Is there some tips? <laughs> okay, so one of the easiest is a great tit because it just sings two syllables. So people call it the teacher bird. Teacher, teacher, teacher. So it's very easy to remember. Oh, that's cool. And I don't, I'm not even good at recognising birds. How do you first get into sort of um, being able to spot birds and know what they are? When you're going birding or watching wildlife in general, the first thing you'll need is binoculars. But don't, don't worry if you don't have that. Just use your senses because it's all part of the experience. Use your senses. Listen for the bird call. You don't even have to know what they are. Just listen to the bird calls and your well-being will be improved. And also, if you want to go the extra mile, buy a field guide, perhaps the birds of Britain and Europe. There are a range of RSBB field guides out there, and they've really helped me improve my bird identification. Isabel, do you think now that you've got time on your hands as well, are you, do you feel like you're more receptive to the bird songs? Are you, are you, like, are you ready to find the birds where you live? Yeah, definitely. I'm quite lucky because I'm in quite a built-up area. We're in a flat, but opposite, we've got a school um, garden. So we've got trees opposite us. So I can just sit and watch out my uh, window. Mm. And I've seen, noticed lots of little ones with flashes of like a golden green colour that I'm, <laughs> I'm trying <laughs> to look up. <laughs> but yeah, no, definitely I'm noticing birds a lot, lot more. And I think appreciating it a lot more because you're sort of slowing down and looking around you a lot more it's wonderful to hear and I actually I, you've got a website haven't you Kabir and I actually was looking at it and you've got a great map of all nature areas and I use that to find um, a little nature reserve near me that um, I, I ran to on my on a run last weekend oh thank you that's amazing. Brilliant little guide. Well, thank you. My map shows all the nature reserves and designated wildlife sites, which protects them for the future, really, and the species that live in those habitats. And overall, these particular designated sites encourage the coexistence of people and wildlife so they can interact, so people can exercise during the lockdown. Yeah. And subconsciously, they're coexisting with wildlife in the habitats around them which is fascinating. I, yeah, I think that's a really good point because especially in cities where you, 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 you almost don't see, I feel like when you're in the countryside, you appreciate nature because you're almost in their terrain. Whilst in the city, it's so easy to ignore, but it's, I think if you notice it, you're more kind of willing to protect it and facilitate nature. Um, and it's the small steps that almost like just awakening the idea of, you know, the, hey, there is a bird, put a feeder out there, support kind of almost this ecosystem that's is still in the urban area. Um, because there's this common misconception with many people that London and any urban area really is just a place of noise and over an overcrowded place with lots of pollution. And that you can, you can look at it, people can choose to look at it at that angle or they can decide to discover what I like to call the wild side of London, <laughs> which is kind of a patchwork of green and blue spaces and designated wildlife sites as well, because there's so much to discover. They all have their own stories and um, they can choose to discover that for themselves because it's all lying on their doorstep. Yeah, there are so many green spaces in London. I think 
I just walking around my local area more and more recently, it's just everywhere are beautiful little sort of community gardens set up and lots of um, the estates near me, they've set up little allotments and wildlife areas and yes. you just, you, you don't need a big space, you can sort of do sort of little, those little bug hotel things are really fun and all sorts Ooh, of that? stuff people have got up to. Well, yeah, bug hotels are great. What? That, yeah. How, do you know about them, Kabir? Yes, I've got one in my garden. What? It, what is a bug hotel? Um, it's like it's made of, of logs and stuff like that, just for as a sort of space to, for bugs to go and hang out. <laughs> Just me, friends. Basically, it's basically like a collection of uh, logs, um, bamboo sticks, pine cones, and you just put them all together in a kind of a house-shaped structure. And you call that a bug hotel. But no, it's a very good way of attracting insects. Okay, Kabir, I really want to dig into why you like birds and if there are any other animals that might come, I'm assuming, a close second to your love of birds. I've always loved birds, particularly because it's what has surrounded, or particularly, particularly because that's all I've seen in my local area. And going further afield around London, it was, again, predominantly birds. There were fewer mammals. Yes, we had foxes and perhaps the wo- uh, sorry, perhaps the squirrels and the odd wood mouse. But it was particularly bird life that I was fascinated with. And there was so much of it. There is such a variety of species just here in the UK. And even in our urban areas, there are so many different species. And I found that remarkable. And I wanted to make a difference for the birds on my doorstep in particular. So I hung up bird feeders. I made a pond out of a container, which has been quite successful. And a bird bath, it's really important at this time of year that birds uh, need, well, birds need water and especially at this time of year. My favorite bird is a kingfisher because of its vibrant colors. And when it just flies past you, it's like a flash of blue and gold. It really makes you I've been lucky enough to see them on a number of occasions. Can you see kingfishers in London? Yes, you can see them at Rain and Marshes and Havering in East London, that's bordering the Thames Estuary. There's another site on the Thames called London Wetland Centre, which is quite popular for wildlife watchers, popular with wildlife watchers, sorry. And you can see kingfishers there and generally in wetland areas with reed bed around London. Lots and lots of kingfishers. So, for now, during um, while we can't get out to these wetlands and stuff, you started telling us some tips about attracting the wildlife to you. Have you got any other tips of how we should do this? So, even if you're on a balcony, you can still put wildflowers in a pot and wait for bees and butterflies and other pollinators to come. And you can even put out a container, fill it with rainwater put plant, uh, put aquatic plants in it, and you've got a pond, there is still so much you can do even on a balcony. And if you've just got a window, you can attach a pole to the side of the window and ha- hang bird feeders from there. That sounds, yeah. I just think this is the perfect time. I just want to now just get started and just almost renovate my garden. Get your binoculars. Yeah. Um, Kabir, I wanted to ask how important is nature to you and and what does it mean to you and and do you think it's actually really important for everyone both you know you know children and adults to get out there um in some form yes definitely because personally nature helps me when i am very stressed on a particular day when i've got too much homework or exams or tests i go into my garden or the local woods or a local green space. And it's a great place to contemplate, to enjoy the natural world, the bird song, the wildflowers, the different habitats. It's all quite a relaxing experience. Yeah. Isabel, what does, na- do, does nature mean a lot to you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm exactly the same. I, I love um, going out into nature if I'm feeling stressed or just, I don't know, a bit overwhelmed with the world. You just sort of go... It just sort of takes your mind off everything. Um, so that's why, yeah, so being in a 
garden less flat. I'm sort of thinking of novel ways to sort of get my nature fix at the moment. Yeah, no, I agree. I think especially now more than ever. Um, and, and I think there is um, there is a, a, a privilege to having some sort of nature because I know there are lots of people who may not who not be who may not be able to readily access nature. But I just think you know it has such a um, impact on like well-being and stress I feel so relaxed when I'm in nature I feel better um especially when you're worried about the state of the world yes because what I want to well what I want to do especially it's because at this very uncertain time we need to make the most of it and improve our well-being massively by enjoying the wildlife on our very doorstep we might not necessarily be able to go even to our local green space. And I want this message to be delivered to young people, especially. Young people are spending the least time outside in human history. I've read this book by Robert McFarlane and Jackie Morris, and it was called The Lost Words. It depicted all the words that had been lost from children's vocabulary to do with nature, for example, acorn or kingfisher. And this is all because our generation is losing the, the comfort and space that they need in the natural world. They're spending more time indoors than ever. It's very worrying. So they need to take this opportunity and enjoy the nature, whether it be on their, on their garden, their balcony, look out for birds flying past their window. It will improve their well-being massively. Uh, th- this might even help them combat the stress that they're getting from homework. It can help. It's very, very therapeutic. Yeah, and just to sorry to interject, what what kind of what birds could we see in London around this time of year? Well, swifts and swallows because they're migrating from Africa to breed here in the UK in the summer, and they'll leave in about the autumn around September. You can hear swifts by their characteristic screeching, and you can find them in groups of up to four or five in the evenings, especially. And you get birds called hirundines too which is the collective term for swallows, house martins, and sand martins. And they're coming from Africa as well to breed. And and for for me, the swifts are the real harbinger of spring. When I hear the characteristic screeching over my house, I'm just thinking spring is here, but I haven't yet heard that. So I'm still waiting. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. We'll we'll listen out for the first signs of spring then. exactly. (laughs) I just yeah. I mean, now I'm going to be so tuned. I think I'm just going to be on YouTube listening to different bird songs. So I can spot them in my garden. Um, and RSPB have a lot of um, identification guides, don't they? Online? Yeah, they have an identification guide online. So if you're not sure of a bird, I found it's very useful for identifying it, especially for beginners, people who are new to identifying birds. Yeah. Uh- <laughs> I think they, they have little recordings, I think, of the, the calls as well. And yeah, then so you can start practicing. Yeah. yeah. I think what's going to happen, Kabir, is we'll bring you back in a month's time and you can test me on my bird knowledge. We'll have a quiz or something. Um, <laughs> okay. And I'll be ready. Obviously, I'm going to try my best. Don't, you know, don't be too harsh, but I'm, I'm ready for the challenge. <laughs> no, I'm not very good at all myself. Uh, I mean, you've, you taught me teacher, teacher. So I'll, that is one thing I'll take away. Finally, then, Kabir, what what are your kind of hopes when once lockdown is lifted? What are your plans? Are you just going to run to your na- local nature reserve and just stay there? That's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. That's one of the options. One of the options. My hope is that people will change their attitudes significantly towards the wildlife and nature in their local area. Because before the lockdown, they may have thought, oh, there are only pigeons and rats in my local area. But now they may see foxes, house martins, swifts, and a multitude of different species. And they might, they might, their well-being might even be improved. And I want to see the biggest change in young people. I want to see them spending time outside and enjoying making a difference for the wildlife on their doorstep. I want to see them enjoying and benefiting I want to see their well-being being improved by them making ponds and putting out bird feeders and planting wildflowers in their window boxes or perhaps even attaching a pole to their window and adding bird feeders there. It's all contributing. 
Wow, that's a powerful call to action um, and, and a great way to end. Uh, thank you so much, Kabir. Um, and yeah, I, I'll, I'll definitely be out and about today just to soaking in your inspiration. Yeah, thank you so Have much. Really day. interesting. Thank you. It's wonderful to talk to you. It was so good to speak to Kabir and it really has me itching to kind of just transform my garden into a bird paradise. What, what Do you have any takeaways, Isabel? Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be looking at the identification guides RSPB have up and try and look, try and pinpoint what birds I've been seeing. No, honestly, and also now I know how to start my own bird calls. But I think I'm really impressed because as someone who also is, you know, you know, born and bred in a city. I really didn't appreciate nature in a city. Eh? So it's so good to see um, someone so someone young um, and isn't kind of always looking to the countryside, but is actually really tapping into the natural world that exists within London. Definitely. And then being able to teach us about it. It's really cool. Exactly. He's, he's doing a massive public service. Okay, that's it from us. If you want more tips on how to be green during the lockdown, then you can head to friendsoftheearth.uk for more information. Take care and see you soon. Bye. See you. Bye.